series looking at the, the book of Jonah, and we looked at the opening five verses of chapter one, and we were reminded that Jonah was the only prophet who heard from God and ran. And in fact, on the back of your worship bulletin this morning is the map that was there last week, showing visually how far he ran. He went to a place called Tarshish, which is in modern-day Spain, and so in his day, that was the end of the world. There wasn't anything beyond the coast of Western Europe. So he literally went to the end of the earth to get away from what God was asking him to do. We were also reminded last week as we uh, got into the book of Jonah that the central character of the book of Jonah is not Jonah. The central character of the book of Jonah is God. Jonah is the main earthly character, but ultimately the book is about the character of God. And that's where we want to focus our attention. What does this book say to us about God? about God, how God works, and what does it say to us about the character of God? And so where we kind of keyed in last Sunday was looking at Jonah seeing God's involvement in his life as being an interruption. It can happen to us as well, whenever you and I make as our top priority or idolize our own comforts, our own goals, our own ambitions, our own plans, we too will see God's acting in our life as an interruption. And so what Jonah is in need of here, and what we are often in need of, is making that shift from seeing what God is desiring to do in our life and in the world around us, not as an interruption, but as an invitation to participate with him in where he is intervening. So that's where we were last week. So this morning, we're going to pick up with exactly where we left off, and we're going to begin in the fifth verse of Jonah chapter 1. And of course, Jonah is in the process of fleeing, and so he's out off the Mediterranean and says, The Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up. Call on your God. Maybe he will take note of, notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? For what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, well, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not. They cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and made vows to him. 
In the opening verses of chapter 1, in fact, twice in verse 3 and again in verse 10, we have the phrase that Jonah fled from the Lord, ran away from the Lord. That phrase in Hebrew was used to describe one who would leave the audience of a king. So if the king were speaking before an assembly, much as I am doing before you, and someone in that assembly got up in the midst of the king speaking and left the premises, the Hebrew phrase for that action is the exact same phrase that is being used here to talk about Jonah leaving, fleeing, running away from God. Now the interesting thing is, and we want to make a, make a couple of uh, just kind of notes here about Jonah's flight. Jonah cannot leave the omnipresence of God. But he is leaving the manifested presence of God. And by that, I mean this. God is everywhere. God is everywhere. So Jonah cannot flee the omnipresence of God. And remember, Jonah's already a prophet by the time we get to the book of Jonah. We, we're reminded that in the book of 2 Kings that, that he had already been acting as a prophet during the reign of, reign of King Jeroboam. So he knew this. He understood this. That he can't leave. He can't flee. He can't go anywhere, including to the end of the earth, and be away from the omnipresence of God. In fact, Psalm 139 says... Where can I go from your spirit? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I lie down in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the shore of the part of the sea, there your hand is. We cannot go anywhere but what God is not present. So Jonah can't believe the omnipresence of God, but what Jonah is getting away from is the manifested, active, engaging presence of God in his life. It reminds me of a little bit, this metaphor won't capture all of what I'm trying to convey, but it reminds me a little bit when I was in high school and college, you know, there were some classes that I really liked. There were some subjects I just kind of sank my teeth into. And then there were other classes and other subjects that did not fall into that category. And I remember my freshman year at Radford University, I had to take a science. And so you had chemistry, you had physics, you had biology, and you had geology. I signed up for geology. I thought there's no way I could do physics and I had done biology and chemistry and Patrick Henry and I, I didn't do so hot. So I thought, okay, I'm going to give geology a go. And I don't know about you, but, but with me, if, if I was in a class that I, I really didn't want to be engaged, in other words, I, I didn't want the professor to call on me, I didn't want to respond out loud to any, any questions he or she might ever ask, in the class. I just kind of wanted to show up, just kind of be quiet and invisible, and when the class was done, just kind of kind of just, just leave the room. And and if you were like me, I and you had that kind of an attitude in a, in a particular class or I hugged the back wall. The back row was where I wanted to be. So in geology, I got in the back farthest corner of Dr. Basu's geology class up in Branson University. I didn't want him to call on me. I didn't want him to see me. I didn't want to be engaged in that, you know, what, whatsoever. Now, if it was a class I really liked, I, I'd move up. Now, I, wasn't, I was never a front row guy, but I, I, I'd get maybe in the, in the front third of the class, and, you know, I'd be more than happy to respond or ask questions or engage what was going on in, in the classroom. Jonah is hugging the back wall. He doesn't mind being 
in the omnipresence of God, but he doesn't want God to engage him. <laughs> he doesn't want to participate. He doesn't want to get active in what God is, is doing. And so he's just kind of hugging the back wall. And that kind of reminds us of a, of a second principle. The first is that you and I can never go anywhere with what God is in present. But we can try our best to get away from being engaged by his presence. That's what Jonah's up to. The second principle is this. Remember, Jonah's already a prophet. He's already a prophet. You and I can be engaged in religious activities and not have or desire intimacy with God. The amazing thing for me when we think about this is kind of we just teeing up the book of Jonah is uh, Jonah had he had been used to hearing from the Lord. I mean, he had already prophesied the prosperity and the security of Israel, according to 2 Kings, while King Jeroboam was on the throne. And what Jonah had predicted, what Jonah had prophesied, the word of the Lord that had been delivered through him by God, had come to pass. So Jonah was used to the vocation of being a prophet. And so for all of that activity that he had been doing, and for that position he held, and for that knowledge he possessed, he lacked in this moment, in this season, in this book, intimacy with God. You know, if we're not careful, that same thing can happen to you and me. We can engage in religious activity. We, we can engage in, in church stuff. And yet lack intimacy with God. That is never a substitute for and can never be a substitute for intimacy with God. And so those are two immediate kind of takeaways we can, we can have this morning from just looking at these opening verses in the first chapter of the book of Jonah. Let me share with you a couple more principles that, at least for me, speak to what is going on here. And again, remember, the central character is God. The central character is God. Another thing that, that speaks to me in, in verses 5 through 16 is that the storm did not awaken Jonah. The boat captain did. Now, most scholars believe that the boat captain, in fact, were probably Phoenicians. We don't know that. The Bible doesn't say that. But at that particular point in time, the Phoenicians were the ones who really kind of controlled the Mediterranean. They were the culture that literally sailed the seas in and around the Mediterranean. They, they transported goods back and forth, trade routes and all of that kind of thing. They were familiar with all the ports. And so many scholars and Bible commentators believe that the boat captain and the crew may have been Phoenician. What we do know is this, is they're not believers. In fact, where we began in Scripture this morning in the book of Jonah is they're polytheistic. Man, once it starts getting rough out on the Mediterranean, they just start hollering at any, any God they can come up with. They're just talking to anybody they think's up there. So these are not Hebrews. These are not believers. These are not men of, of faith to Yahweh, to the Lord, the maker of land and sea, as Jonah described. These are non believers. It's interesting that Jonah, who is a believer, has to be roused by a non believer. God will use non-believers to sometimes rouse believers. <coughs> there are moments and there are places in Scripture where God, because His person or His people have lacked intimacy with Him or are in open rebellion to Him, He will step out of using His chosen people or His chosen person to use another to speak to the people that are his own. 
And it's pretty amazing in this passage in Jonah chapter 1 that a pagan, polytheistic, non-believing boat captain has to go to a believing prophet of Yahweh and say, you know what, it might be a better thing if you would wake up and pray to your God. You know, sometimes, sad to say, the world out there has to awaken the church in here to what we need to be doing. Now, I'm going to give you two examples, and I'm not picking on any groups. In fact, I'm going to be an equal opportunity employer in this moment, okay? But for years... I have just been upset by what has come to light with predatory priests. Why did it take the Boston Globe and now district attorneys in the state of Pennsylvania to bring justice to a situation that the church itself should have dealt with decades ago. Amen. The bottom line is, sad to say, if journalists and district attorneys out there hadn't pressed and investigated and uncovered, all of that would be going on in the church today. Again, I'm going to be an equal opportunity employer. Because I'm not needing to pick on the Roman Catholic Church. I consider the Catholics to be my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I'm just saying it's a perfect example of where the secular culture had to move in such a way to get the Christian church to do what it should have been doing without that prompt. <clears throat> Sometimes non-believers, and I'm not saying those that work at Boston Globe and District Attorneys in Commonwealth of Pennsylvania are non-believers. Just saying sometimes those outside the body of Christ, outside of God's chosen, he will use to awaken his people. Me Too movement, right? Kind of came into the fore what, three or four years ago. Again, I, I don't know about you all, but when I started reading accounts of what celebrity men, most of them were celebrities, whether they were in business, whether they were in journalism, whether they were in sports, whatever they were, when I began to uh, read the accounts of how they conducted themselves, I remember thinking to myself, what man would do that? So we have the Me Too move. A few months ago, the president of the largest Southern Baptist seminary was told he was going to retire. Now, he hadn't done anything physically to a cost of a woman. But women at that seminary began to come forward with stories where they had sought his counsel and advice. And then his sermons began to be replayed, because all of them had been recorded. His counsel and his sermons had been to women who were experiencing physical abuse, being beat up and slapped around by their husbands. Forgive them, go back to them, and submit to them, because that's what Scripture says. Now, you can do that for years. If it weren't for the Me Too movement out there, he'd still be misquoting and misapplying the Bible down there today. So don't think that this is a rare thing where sometimes those outside the body of believers challenge 
and have to call to awaken and arouse the body of believers to do what they're supposed to do. And so, in the book of Jonah, we had a pagan, polytheistic, probably Phoenician boat captain <laughs> goes down in the midst of a storm that Jonah's Lord, Yahweh, had sent and said, you know what, why don't you, why don't you wake up and, and start praying? Why don't you wake up and start praying? And I know, I'll have to say to you, I mean, God has used non-believers to say things to me I need to hear. God will use those out there to speak to those in here. In verse 14, another principle. Pagan sailors begin to pray to the Lord. And the word the Lord there, at the end of, of our passage this morning, the word that they're using is the covenantal name for God. They begin to pray not to this kind of pantheon of gods, not just kind of throwing things up in the air and calling on whomever, but they all of a sudden, through what God is doing, they begin to call on Yahweh. They begin to call on the Lord, the God of Jonah. And not only that, but Scripture says that they begin to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. They begin to make vows to the Lord. <laughs> They do all of this while Jonah, the prophet, is floundering in sin. So another principle that for me emerges from this passage is that, you know what, even in our rebellion, God is at work. Even in our rebellion, God is at work. Even in this moment in Jonah's life, when he is openly rebelling against what God wants him to do, and the prophet God wants him to be in that season, in that moment, in that time, even in the midst of Jonah's rebellion, God's at work. God's at work. God has done something in the lives of that captain and folk crew, who are not Hebrews, that he is going to do in the lives of the Ninevites, who aren't Hebrews. You see, God's at work. God's at work. Even in the midst of Jonah's rebellion. Let me suggest to you that the takeaway from that is you may have had a season in your life, you may have had a moment in your life that when you look back and say, you know what, I'm not proud of that. That wasn't my best. In fact, it could have been a moment or a time in your life when you were in open rebellion to God. But the good news from the book of Jonah this morning is, you know what, God, God, God can work in that. God can use that for His purpose and His plan. Priscilla Shire, who some of you ladies, you all have studied her in some of your small groups, some of her material, you know, she does just a, just a great job. She, she put it this way, and I, I really like this kind of illustration because it's something all of us can identify with. She says that when she comes home at the end of the day, she's got family, you know, and whatnot, and she said she'd love to be Paula Dean. She'd love to be Paula Dean. And if you're not familiar with Paula Dean, she's the queen of Southern cooking. She said, I, I just love to be Paula Dean and just put something out there that, 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 that meets that standard, that Paula Dean standard. She said, I'd love to come home and put something on the dinner table that looked like it had been photographed for the cover of Southern Living Magazine. Every once in a while we get Southern Living Magazine and they'll have like an eight-layer cake on the cover. And I'll, I'll look at Kathy and I'll hold that magazine up and say, this looks good. <laughs> and she'll look back at me and she said, doesn't it, though? <laughs> Look like Martha Stewart just left. But she said, the reality is when I get home, she goes, I go into my kitchen, I'm bumping into kids, she goes, I open up the refrigerator, I just kind of rummage around in there, and if it doesn't have mold on it, that leftover is good. 
good to go. <laughs> and she said, well, I can do something with leftovers. I can make a meal out of leftovers. God can take our leftovers. 